All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. If, if uh, Mr. Trendle, Don, if you two are ready to go, we are going to start. So, all right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to World Affairs Fridays with the Peoria Area World Affairs Council and Bradley University. This morning, we are delighted to have Giles Trendle with us. He is the Managing Director of Al Jazeera English Channel, where he oversees an editorial staff of over 400 people based in its centers in Doha, London, Washington, uh, Washington, D.C., Kuala Lumpur, as well as in over 70 bureaus around the world. Giles first joined Al Jazeera in 2004 to work on the Arabic Channel's flagship investigative documentary show before moving to Al Jazeera English ahead of its launch in 2006. He began his career in the mid-1980s as a freelance print journalist based in Lebanon covering that country's civil war. Giles resides in Qatar where the Al Jazeera media network is headquartered. Al Jazeera English produces 24-7 news and current affairs programming for a worldwide TV audience of over 315 million households and a mobile content for global digital, digital computer consumers. This morning, Don Sanford will be leading our discussion with Mr. Trendle. And Don, take it away. All right. Well, Mr. Trendle is going to be making some opening remarks, but before he does, uh, as I've, I've told him, I think twice, uh, I'm extremely honored. I, I had the chance to uh, receive a briefing from him in October 2018 at the Al Jazeera studios uh, and offices, uh, which was on our leadership mission through the World Affairs Council, was my top pick what I wanted to research and study. So I was very thrilled to get that opportunity. Uh, and it was very, very informative. Um, but I, I have to say before you begin your, uh, your presentation, your picture behind you, <laughs> it makes me think of the sunsets that I saw while I was in Doha uh, and the various boats. So uh, I just want you to know that it's extremely beautiful. So again, very honored, very thankful that you are kind enough to give us uh, of your valuable time. It is 7 p.m. everyone in Doha, actually a little after now. So uh, without wasting any more time, Mr. Trendle, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Actually, 8 p.m., just after 8 p.m. Oh, eight, eight. Okay, I found out. <laughs> um, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to, to be here uh, um, and to be here online with you all. Uh, what I thought I'd do, I'd just give a sort of potted history of Al Jazeera, uh, firstly, and um, speak for about... 15, 10, 15 minutes, and then I think the idea is I'll, I'll throw open and very happy to answer questions. Um, all questions, no, there's no taboos, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, as Don knows, uh, when he was here in Doha, we had many questions um, fired at us, and we're more than happy to answer any question. Uh, so, so I work with Al Jazeera English, although I did start with Al Jazeera Arabic. I worked with Al Jazeera Arab Arabic for two years, and then I joined Al Jazeera English when it started. Uh, Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera Arabic, although they have the same editorial philosophy and code of ethics, they are two different and distinct channels because obviously they're two different audiences. Al Jazeera Arabic is broadcasting to the Arab world, whereas Al Jazeera English is broadcasting internationally to the English language speaking world. So Al Jazeera started in 1996, and this was Al Jazeera Arabic. Um, before 1996, you just need to know what the media scene in the Arab world was like. Uh, it was, I, could, I guess it could be summarized as uncritical admiration of all the different regimes. The media uh, in the Arab world was always controlled by the state. And the news bulletins were always of who the president or who the king was meeting. Lots of handshakes, lots of um, grand openings, lots of ribbon cuttings. And that was the sort of main fare of, of Arab, the Arab media scene. So it was very much a case of the Arab media being a, an appendage of, of the government. So when Al Jazeera Arabic launched in 1996, it was something of a revolution. Um, just to give two examples, uh, there were live phone-ins on Al Jazeera, and this was unheard of for people to phone in and, and say their opinions live on air. It was something that was really unheard of. Um, and then, of course, Al Jazeera Arabic was the first Arab TV to feature Israeli uh, spokes spokespeople and to hear the Israeli narrative. 
Um, so Israeli men and Israeli women, um, spokesmen for the government or the military would, would come on, on uh, be invited on Al Jazeera Arabic. And that was something that was seen as, as again, a revolution in the Arab, Arab scene. From the West, Al Jazeera was seen as a beacon of a breath of fresh air and a beacon of democracy. That's what it was described as. Um, but in the Arab world, there was a lot of concern about Al Jazeera. Um, the editorial policy, the ed independent editorial policy of Al Jazeera put it on a bit of a collision course with some Arab countries who didn't appreciate this new fresh air of, of dem democracy and people being able to have their say. And as we'll speak, that that's sort of that has always been a feature of some Arab regimes in, in the in the world. Uh, I guess for Al Jazeera, jumping ahead to 2011, Al Jazeera English really, we although Al Jazeera English started in 2006, we certainly made our name in 2011 when there was the the so-called Arab Spring. This was when. Um, there were waves of popular protest around the, the Middle East. I'm sure you will remember. Uh, it started off in Tunisia, and the, the regime in Tunisia fell. Then it moved on to Egypt, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere. Uh, of course, Al Jazeera was covering this on the ground, and uh, it was something that some Arab governments in the Middle East didn't appreciate. Uh, some Arab governments opposed the, the wave of uh, popular protests, uh, they, they, were, they felt threatened by it, and they didn't appreciate that Al Jazeera was reporting on the Arab Spring and the Arab uprisings. Uh, <clears throat> moving on, um, this really is the background to what happened then in 2017 when uh, the three of the countries in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, also joined by Egypt, um, decided to boycott or, or blockade, if you like, um, Qatar with a sort of trade and diplomatic blockade. And they demanded various things. They accused Qatar of supporting terrorism, which Qatar rejected. Uh, and one of the demands made was for the closure of Al Jazeera network. At the time, uh, I compared it rather like the, I'll give an, a, I'm sorry, I'm a European, so I'll give a European example, but it was rather like, like the European Union demanding the closure of the BBC. Um, it was something that was quite shocking for these neighboring Arab countries to demand the closure of a major broadcaster. In the region. Um, but the background that I had mentioned about the concern of Al Jazeera's reporting in the region played into this and was one of the reasons why there was this demand to shut down Al Jazeera because some of the regimes in the region felt threatened by the what I would you know the independent reporting um, of Al Jazeera. So there was the demand to shut down. Um, it was internationally recognized by international groups as something that was outrageous. Al Jazeera derived a lot of support from international groups, human rights organizations, media organizations, even um, politicians from around the world. Um, and even to this day, I think many, many people uh, criticize the, the blockade and um, the crisis in the Gulf that has happened. Um, we have suffered from uh, great, great uh, sort of attacks on the media. I, I'd like to talk about this. Um, Al Jazeera has had a very tough history of being attacked. Um, since, since it started in 1996, 11 of our journalists have been killed um, in the line of duty, either in crossfire or in some cases possibly being deliberately targeted. Uh, we have had countless journalists intimidated, harassed, uh, imprisoned. Uh, we still have a journalist who's uh, imprisoned in Egypt. He was um, detained in December 2016, so uh, four years ago, and 
Uh, he hasn't faced a court yet. He hasn't been officially sentenced. Uh, he has His detention has just been extended over the course of four years, which is in violation of both Egyptian law and international law. And he's still being held to this day in Egypt, in Cairo. Uh, what happened there, he, he, he was an Egyptian working in, in Doha here in the capital of Qatar. He went home to Egypt to see his family. He didn't, he wasn't working and he got picked up uh, and basically detained and he's been in detention ever since. So for four years now. Uh, we've had other cases of uh, our journalists being detained, um, particularly in Egypt. Uh, eventually some, most of them were released, but some of them are still sentenced in absentia, those that weren't in Egypt at the time. Um, there have been a number of tweets from around the region. From One of them was from the Emirates, the a security chief in Dubai, who tweeted that Al Jazeera should be bombed. The, the, that's the, co the compound where I work here in Doha, that it should be bombed. Um, but I think what we're seeing is, is that's the experience of Al Jazeera, but, but uh, we're seeing this more, more generally. Let me just give two other examples and then I'll speak more generally about media under, under attack. Um, one thing that we are increasingly seeing is the online harassment of female journalists. And to give two examples, uh, for Al Jazeera English, our White House correspondent, Kimberly, this was earlier this year, uh, she was at a White House press briefing, which was being held by the White House press secretary, Kaylee McKenney. And um, Kimberly, our correspondent, was asking a question. And um, Kaylee, the White House press secretary, responded. And our correspondent said something sort of off mic, but the mic picked it up. And it was reported. Um, and excuse the language, but this is what was reported, that our White House correspondent said, you lying bitch, to the White House press secretary. Well, actually, that wasn't the case. The audio was manipulated. Um, and this has been commonly re reported. You can, you can uh, Google it and you'll see the story that appeared. Um, but it was an example of audio being manipulated and trying to make Al Jazeera look bad. Uh, actually, the White House transcript proved that our correspondent hadn't said that. Actually, what she had said is, oh, okay, you're not going to engage further. But those words were, were manipulated in a way to make it sound like she had said something else and had been disrespectful. So what happened, um, the story went out on, on on Twitter that she had said these words and then she started to get um, online threats, abuse, death threats from, from you know, certain uh, quarters uh, because they felt that she had said this or they believed the reports on Twitter when she hadn't. That was one example. Another example from Al Jazeera Arabic, our correspondent, one of our female presenters from Al Jazeera Arabic had her phone hacked and various photos of her swimming um, were shared online and there was a photo of her swimming in a bikini and that was uh, posted online and um, it was sort of uh, dig digitally manipulated to make it look like she was naked and there were all sorts of comments made of course this being the Arab world uh, there are a lot of you know there's a lot but sort of conservative um, Lot of conservative elements uh, and they were trying to make her look bad. Um, so that's just another example of the sort of online harassment that journalists are coming under. But as I said, this is more generally, I think what we're seeing in the world is media come increasingly coming under attack. I think hostili hostility towards the media is being normalized. I don't think it helps when the president of the free world calls the media the enemy of the people. And I think a lot of um, people, a lot of rulers around the world will pick up on the words of the American president and, and see it as a license to attack the media in their own country. Uh, and what we're seeing is that 
this is increasingly a, a great concern for us that media generally is becoming um, increasingly attacked uh, around the world. So um, that's a kind of potted history of Al Jazeera. Uh, I would say that um, the staff of Al Jazeera, we, we're, we're a United Nations bunch really. We have, um, we're from all nationalities. I, I can say here in Doha, the, which is the main base, uh, we are something like 80 different nationalities here in Doha. Um, all religions, we've got Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, um, non-believers, uh, all nationalities, all creeds, colors, faiths. And it really is a United Nations and everybody works together. And that's a great strength in our editorial meetings is that you have all these different people from different parts of the world and different beliefs and faiths, but they all come together to fashion out and to, to a, a sort of um, a story, you know, the, the, to report the news and report what's happening in the world. And that, that diversity is a, is a great strength uh, of Al Jazeera. We, over the years, Al Jazeera English has won many awards. We're very proud of the awards that we've won. Of course, awards are uh, international and industry recognition of what we do. Um, we've won some pretty big awards in the United States. We've won uh, some Peabody Awards. The Peabody Award is one of the most prestigious journalism awards in the United States. We've won Emmy Awards again in the States. And earlier this year, we were uh, nom one of our films was nominated for an Oscar. So the team went to Hollywood. Uh, they were one of the top five films that was nominated. Unfortunately, we didn't win, but but uh, we we were very proud of that film. And actually, since then, uh, it's been announced that that film has been the Critics' Choice, winning the Critics' Choice of uh, Best Documentary. And it was a documentary that we made, uh, was made in America. Uh, what else can I tell you? Um, I think I think probably I'll leave, you, leave it there. As I said, we've uh, as as Don and Angela mentioned, we've got um, bureau all around the world. Uh, just to mention, last week and the last two weeks, we've obviously been very focused on covering the big story in the United States. We have a big office in Washington D.C. We also have sort of satellite offices in uh, Miami, Los Angeles, uh, Chicago. And New York and we cover the states and we send out our correspondents all over the United States uh, obviously it's been a very big story for us as it has been for all of the world and uh, we are eagerly and keenly uh, keeping uh, our eye on this story and reporting it um, from all sides we, we report both sides all sides both sides and that's fundamentally our editorial ethos is to report all sides of the story. Um, sometimes, as I said, in the region here, there are certain governments that only want one side of the story told, but it's very much our, our editorial mission to tell all sides of the story. Uh, and even, even when the blockade was on, and uh, as it is still on, we always seek to get all sides from the Gulf. We always invite Saudi guests, Egyptian guests, Emirati or Bahraini guests, um, when and where possible. Uh, some of them don't always want to appear on Al Jazeera, but we always go out of our way and we do indeed get guests from those countries. Uh, so it's very important that we carry on doing that. Um, anyway, that's my outline. Uh, I'm very happy to answer specific questions and go into more detail if there's anything on on specific questions all righty uh dewey if you'll hang on i got uh, i get the prerogative of a few questions and then we'll open it up to all of you then um the oh uh, i know for sure they're going to want to know what the name of the uh, film uh is the which one the documentary that yeah, one that was the, the one that you mentioned yeah uh, with the award. So, um it was called saint Louis Superman. I always tend to say St. Louis. But that's my, my being a European background, but it was St. Louis Superman. And it was basically uh, 
it's, it's, it's what we, it was an observational documentary, which means uh, it focuses on a character uh, and it tells the story of um, African American who, when he was four or five years old, uh, his brother was shot dead in front of him, uh, caught in a crossfire of, of the gang gang warfare in St. St. Louis. And uh, he grows up angry and uh, he decides that he's going to turn this anger into something positive. He, he, he's a, a rapper, he becomes a rapper. Uh, and he decides to run for state representative uh, in Missouri. And he wins and he becomes a state representative. So it follows his story from, you know, angry, angry young man into channeling that anger into uh, doing something positive. It, it's a wonderful story. Um, uh, he, he opposes uh, the gun laws and gun violence and he, he campaigns against that. And it, it's a very powerful story. And of course, it was, it was made before um, the events in earlier this year in, in um, Minnesota, the George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter protests that happened as a result of that. Um, this was a film that was made last year and then was uh, up for an Oscar in January, uh, nominated for an Oscar in ja earlier January this year. Uh, Dewey, I've changed my mind because I also got to visit Al Udeed uh, Air Base, uh, our, our largest uh, base there in the Middle East, and uh, Dewey is a retired Air Force uh, officer. So, Dewey, in honor of you and your service, I'm going to skip and let you go first. Okay, well, Mike, I have two questions. What is your source for hiring all these correspondents? And is there an international correspondence school that turns out independent press people? Okay, so uh, our, we, we, we hire journalists from all over the world. Our main our main priority is that they have good experience and we always look at their experience and their, their talent. It doesn't matter who they are, where they're from, what they, what they believe, uh, as long as they come to us in a way that is, they can undertake objective fact-based journalism. We look at their, their background in terms of their career, their employment background, their, their talent, their skills, and it's very much based on on their experience and their talent and their skills. Uh, our, our, we have great gender balance in our correspondence. We have them all over the world, many different countries, uh, and it really is a reflection of the of our diversity, you know, on screen and off screen behind the camera. In terms of a school for international journalists, uh, well, there, there's. I always think the best school is is experience. Of course, there are uh, universities and, and colleges that run degrees or, or courses in journalism. Actually, many of the journalists, myself included, never formally studied journalism. I studied English language, literature, and philosophy. Uh, and many of the journalists I know, many colleagues, never formally studied journalism. Um, but but you develop a, 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 a knack for doing it through experience. And um, that's, that's, you know, that doesn't mean to say that we don't appreciate people who have studied journalism. It's very important, but it's not a absolute prerequisite for us. Well, and, and um, you and Angela and I were talking uh, uh, before the program started that we have a very large uh, Lebanese uh, American community in the Peoria area, and that uh, you began in 1980, I believe I saw, in Lebanon during the Civil War. So um, we have a lot of people. You want to comment on that too? Yeah, so um, I, my, I, I go back, my time in the Middle East goes back to 1985. That's when I first visited the Middle East. I just finished uh, university in London. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I thought I'll go and teach English and a job offer came up for uh, English teachers wanted in Beirut, no experience necessary. Well, at the time, of course, there was a civil war going on in Beirut. Um, and uh, anyway, I went to Beirut to be an English teacher and stayed there for one year as a teacher. And 
loved loved being there although it was a very difficult time but i loved the country i loved the people and i decided that i would uh, after leaving Lebanon, go back there shortly after to go and get into journalism because I could see that there were not many journalists at the time. In the mid 80s, there was the kidnapping of foreigners, but you know, the biggest story for me was the <clears throat> war going on and all the Lebanese being killed in the civil war, bombing, car bombs, uh, lots of different factions fighting. And I went back to reports uh, in Lebanon on that. So I spent all in all, probably around over the course of about 10 years in, in Beirut uh, over the years, reporting uh, firstly as a print journalist, then getting into radio and then um, doing some phono reports via down, down TV and then getting into documentaries in, in, while I was in Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon is really like a second home to me, even though I hadn't been back for a number of years. But it's the sort of place that as soon as I land in Beirut, I instantly feel at home, even though I haven't been back there for, for many years. Um, it's a wonderful place, but it's such a, such a shame. And actually, I remember interviewing the American ambassador in Beirut. Uh, his name was Ryan Crocker. Oh, yeah. This is um, in the late 80s, I think. And he said something which was always, I will always remember, he said, uh, Lebanon is a bit like a suitcase with a false bottom. You, just when you think you've got to the bottom, there's always another level, you know, there's always another level which it can get worse. And I think we've seen that recently in the last, uh, you know, obviously there's been the political um, problems with the government and, and then there was the economy problems recently. And then, of course, there was the huge bomb, and every every time Lebanon seems to be getting about to get back on its feet, something terrible happens. Um, but it's a wonderful country, and and you can really feel the pulse of the Middle East uh, and what's happening around the world. In fact, by by being in Beirut, which I think is why it was always a great place which journalists enjoyed being in um, because it was a great place to be based and it, and it still is we have an office in Beirut and it's it's uh, it's uh, you know a major part of our reporting from the Middle East um, back to uh, when my group met with you and, and other uh, management there I know the one of the reasons that I go and have always recommended your site to to so many people is you do so many stories about everyday people. Uh, and I think that's another reason you are so appreciated in so many parts of the world that people get their stories out through yours. Um, but what really stands out to me is your documentaries. Uh, for those who aren't familiar on here, there's Inside Story, Fault Lines, Witness, Al Jazeera World, Al Jazeera Landmark, Al Jazeera Close-Up, Al Jazeera Correspondent, Al Jazeera, Jazeera Selects. That's just a few of them. Uh, it's just amazing. And uh, I learned so much uh, from those. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, I, I think, the impressive work that goes on there? Sure. I mean, um, although Al Jazeera English isn't available terrestrially in the U.S., it's, it's available digitally and you can go on to aljazeera.com and all of our content is free, 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 uh, freely available online. I appreciate and, that, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's very important for us to make it freely available, not have any firewalls or paywalls. Uh, but we, yeah, the documentaries um, of, of our daily schedule, about 40% of our daily schedule is programming, um, long form programming, such as documentaries or magazine shows. But documentaries are very important for us. We do win a lot of awards uh, for our documentaries. Uh, we, we think it's very important that beside the news, documentaries allow greater uh, coverage and a great, greater range of storytelling to, to really understand some of the complexities of what's behind the news. The news reporting is very important, but the, the documentaries uh, complement the news reporting because they, they allow you to go deeper, um, uh, wider range, deeper scale, deeper scope to get behind the story and tell the real story. And sometimes um, we can tell stories, very personal stories. We have a, we have a, 
program called Al Jazeera Correspondent, which allows our correspondents to tell more personal stories, which are connected to what's happening in the world. Um, just to give an example, one of our presenters in London, uh, she's Italian, um, and she did a one hour documentary called Fascism in the Family. And um, she's, uh, she had her grandfather was actually um, in the Italian army under Mussolini and was a very close to Mussolini. And she goes back in, in history to um, tell the story of her grandfather. And actually she's married to, to a Jew and her, her, her children are Jewish. So she's going back into the history to look at the history of her grandfather who um, would have not reflected well on, on the children of his granddaughter. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful story that personalizes um, and she connects it to the rise of the right in Italy and, and Europe today. Um, uh, and and it's so, it's so, so those sorts of stories, those sorts of personal stories are really important because they get behind the news and, uh, and the current affairs events. And so those are very important and we do win a lot of awards, which we're very, we're very thankful for. You know, we, we do some great documentaries and, and we get some great industry uh, reaction. But it's very important that it's not just news. We are a channel that provides that deeper level of complexity because it's a complex world and it's not always easy to tell it in a two minute news report. Um, as I said, I, that's what I most appreciate, uh, I, I think, of, of all the work that you do there. Uh, again, as a retired teacher, uh, it is just an incredible resource uh, also. Uh, and I do see that we have a, a Spanish teacher, uh, Aaron uh, Crawford, on here, uh, which you do great work in Latin America. And sometimes it's very difficult, even though there are Southern neighbors, we don't cover a lot. <laughs> uh, we cover Middle East uh, way more than we cover uh, our neighbors. So uh, Aaron, it's a great place to go. You might find some good stuff for your students. Uh, let's get into, um, I, whenever I recommend Al Jazeera, I live in the heart of um, really kind of far right country uh, now. Some of them were never that way before, but uh, 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 I grew up about two and a half hours south of here. And when I go down there, I, I feel like, what happened? I'm in a twilight zone. Uh, so if I mention the word Al Jazeera, uh, it's like a, you're committing treason. There's two <laughs> things I want you to kind of address. One is who you're financed by uh, with, with, with Qatar and the independence you have and uh, why uh, so many in the Western world have this, uh, I believe, a totally unreasonable bias against Al, Al Jazeera. Sure. Okay, so the first, let me answer the first part and then come to the second part. We, we are funded by the state of Qatar, uh, but what we say, uh, you know, we are state funded, but we're not state controlled. And, and I can, you know, hand on heart say that I never get any telephone calls from any government official or minister. Uh, it's, it's what I would say is very much a similar model to the BBC or to France 24 or Deutsche Welle in Germany. It's a public broadcaster. Uh, it's funded by the state, uh, but we have uh, editorial independence to cover whatever story we want. Um, we, in the past, have often run uh, reports or documentaries that, that have got, um, got us into trouble and, and got the Qatar, you know, the relations between Qatar and that particular country have, have become tense. Um, but it's always the same. The, the Qatari government say, you know, you're Al Jazeera, you're separate, uh, you're not part of the government. Uh, and at the same time, we do cover events in Qatar when they are of an international news significance. And we, 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 don't, uh, we don't pull any punches when it comes to Qatar. We have reported uh, on uh, the allegations of corruption over the World Cup. Uh, we've reported on allegations of, of the mistreatment of migrant laborers whenever Amnesty International uh, publishes a report, for example, we will always report that. We have interviewed Qatari officials, uh, you can find them online, the, the interviews that we've done, and we ask them very tough questions and, and we, we grill them. In fact, um, 
there, you know, again, it's all online, but we've grilled the head of the committee leading the World Cup. Uh, we've, we've grilled the foreign minister in the past. Uh, we asked them tough questions about uh, democracy, about Qatar's role in Syria, about the FIFA corruption allegations, about allegations of migrant laborers and mistreatment. So we don't pull any punches. So uh, we very much value that editorial independence. And uh, as I said, we, we, have, we are journalists from all over the world, many Americans, many Brits, many Europeans, Asians, Africans, Middle Easterns. And, and I can tell you, a lot of us wouldn't be here if we felt that we were in any way a tool of propaganda for any any state so uh that's that's that now in terms of you know al jazeera we often get called uh, terrorist tv bin laden tv um we let our journalism speak for itself and the fact that we win international awards like the peabody's and emmys i think is is a, is a great credit to our journalism um, but basically, I think in the past, uh, to go back in a little bit, as I said, Al Jazeera Arabic, when it was first launched, it was, it was very much heralded in, in the West, and particularly in America, as a beacon of democracy in the Middle East. I think things changed slightly after 9-11, and then when the US invaded Iraq. Um, if you remember in 2004, uh, there's a, there was a town in Iraq called Fallujah and the US Marines went into Fallujah and the narrative that the Mr. Rumsfeld, the, then the Secretary of Defense, the narrative he was saying is that, um, you know, we're going after the terrorists. Now we had a correspondent in Fallujah and he was reporting and we were, on Al Jazeera you were seeing in the hospitals, you were seeing uh, men, you know, elderly, women, children, injured, maimed, some of them killed, which was very much against the narrative of what Mr. Rumsfeld was saying at the time. And so that's when uh, I believe the Mr. Rumsfeld himself came out very strongly and actually targeted Al Jazeera saying it's lies, lies, lies. Uh, um, and uh, that's when I think the negative perception of Al Jazeera started because we saw it as doing our job. We were reporting on the American side, but we were also reporting what was happening, uh, where the bombs were landing. And that's one of the things at Al Jazeera, we say that it's different. Many, many channels will show you the bombs from where they're being fired. But with Al Jazeera, we will show and we will be where the bombs are landing. Um, and I think that's very important that we get both sides of those stories. One footnote to that is in 2011, many years later, Mr. Rumsfeld agreed to be interviewed by Al Jazeera and he praised us in that interview. Again, it's online. Um, he was praising Al Jazeera. Uh, Mr. Rumsfeld has praised Al Jazeera. Hillary Clinton has praised Al Jazeera. Uh, we've been praised by many American politicians for for um, being quite, uh, you know, objective. And actually, if, if you're interested, I have a one minute clip that I'd like to show you, if I can. Let me see if I can technically. Now, just to set this up, this was an interview done about three days ago with an advisor, a former advisor to Mr. Trump. We were, we were talking about COVID situation, and then we asked him about the election. And let me see if I can pull this up and play it to you. Um, Sounds good. If the, can you see that? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. I'll come in on the question from the um, interviewer. All right. Well, I don't have audio. You don't have audio? No. Oh, dear. Um, Let's and see if I go out. Fine, but yeah. Okay, let me try one more time and right. see if this is going to work. Uh, if it doesn't work now, I will 
Sorry, let me just see if I can get this. Can you hear that? Yes. Yeah, it's a little bit. Yeah, it was a little bit blurry. Some of us are getting hard of hearing as we age. <laughs> just a sec, let me see if I can pull it up. All right. Can you hear that? No, cannot. Okay. Now, I think when you when you start your video, sir, I think you need to. There's three dots, um, maybe at the top right or the bottom right, that say share your audio also. Oh. Ah, yes, three dots. Okay. Um. um no, you can't. You no. can't hear this. No. No. No, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. No, okay. Uh, I'm going to turn it off. Sorry. All right. Okay. Um, it's pity, but basically, we we interviewed about uh, this was about three days ago a, um, a former Mr. Trump, advisor of Mr. Trump, and he was basically saying in this interview that he was praising Al Jazeera for showing all both sides of the story, uh, and he said that. He, in his, in his opinion, he said American media was what he described as a train wreck. That there were, either, you know, you, uh, it was either presenting one side or another. So if it was Fox, it was one side. If it was CNN, it was another side. And he was basically praising Al Jazeera for showing both sides of the story. And and that's very much what we've been doing in the last few days and and weeks. And and it's something we do anyway. But showing the Republicans, the Democrats, supporters of Mr. Trump, supporters of Mr. Biden and making sure that we see all sides of the story. But um, we, yes, yeah, so uh, that I think provides an answer, I think, to your question. Yeah, Don. excellent, because that's usually, you know, the confrontation uh, that, that I face when I, I try to point out, I think you're one of the best sources uh, that's out there now. I, another thing maybe to address is the fact that, and, and it really kind of started when Fox came on, uh, and it just made huge amounts of money. We then started to see, and I started to read that um, CNN, um, a lot of the uh, CBS, all of them started to pull back uh, their international correspondence. And so we don't have the footprint we used to have. In fact, some of them have almost no footprint any longer and have to rely on either freelance or somebody else. They don't have their bureaus and so on. You're going the other direction. It seems to me that uh, you, you've got a footprint that's incredible. Address that a little bit. Yeah, we have something like over 70 different, or we have over 70 bureau in different parts of the world. Uh, and that's very important for us to have a footprint. And it goes to very much to what I was saying that, that for us, we need to be there on the ground and not just be reporting from the centers of power, so to speak, but be reporting at the, the sharp end, wherever that may be. And so we have these uh, bureaus, some of them might be a small office uh, with a, just a cameraman and a reporter. Others are slightly larger, but it's very important that we, we are on the ground and that we can deploy quickly should we need to get anywhere. Um, and pretty much wherever something happens in the world, we have somebody usually quite nearby. Things have got a little bit more difficult with COVID, with the, uh, the restrictions on travel. Um, but, but it's very important that we, we, we maintain that network of correspondence. And a lot of these correspondents are actually people who live, you know, they are people of that country. Um, so we don't uh, always, as we say, do parachute journalism, where we're flying somebody in um, who stays there for a week, reports, and then goes back home. Our, many of our correspondents live um, in these countries and, and are actually you know, nationals of these countries. Um, so that's, that's again, that, that diversity and that's very important and, and understanding the, the, the context and the local context is very important to us. Um, that, that to me is a key, a key point, again, as, as a retired educator, having the bureaus, having people live in those countries um, you begin to understand the people you're covering. And so much of news I will read sometimes 
Uh, that's our complaint here in the United States, that the East Coast establishment, uh, when they report, they just have no concept of what's going on in the rest of the country. Um, and there's, I think, more validity that way. We do have a question from Julia uh, Gantos. And Julia um, uh, lived for a while uh, in, uh, in Doha, uh, Dar, so she is a, a former resident as well and went on a, le a second leadership mission and may have met also with you. But she asked, how has citizen journalism affected mainstream media? Yeah, great question. I mean, citizen journalism is, is something that is increasingly important. What's happening in the world today is that uh, in the past, you needed a cameraman and a sound man and a producer and a lighting and a correspondent. Now we can make films on, on these things. Um, and in fact, we have made a documentary in 2011. We made a documentary on an iPhone uh, from Syria. Uh, and of course, you can imagine when you're in a war zone, it's very, it's easier to be carrying something like this and filming with it than a five man or a five person crew. So uh, the kind of democratization of technology allowing for more and more people to to film and to tell the stories. And so user generated content is very important for us when we have uh, when there are natural disasters or when there is, you'll remember actually, Julia, the, 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 of course, the um, explosion in Beirut, a lot of the footage and the pictures that come instantaneously are from people standing on their balcony. For example, in the Beirut explosion, you know, there were people standing on their balcony filming the fire and the smoke when the thing exploded. Um, so we get that pretty quickly obviously there are we have verification processes because you have to be sure that the content that you're getting from the public uh is is legitimate and bona fide we have ways of verifying content uh, i think that's another thing that we're seeing increasingly is that as much as it's great to have all this content coming in from users you know, there are always bad faith actors who are going to try and um, suggest that, that that footage is something other than it is or it's a setup. But um, it's very important that citizen journalism is increasingly a big uh, asset to the way that we cover the world. Uh, we, uh, yeah, Julia, you want to jump in? I, I didn't know if I heard your voice or not. I just want to say thank you very much and thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Your pleasure. Thank you. And uh, she's also of Lebanese descent. So <laughs> you, you yeah, I, I, got, I got the surname, uh, Gantus. Uh. <laughs> and yeah. it's Isa, Isa Gantus, yes. Yes. And in fact, Gantus is a, with a, is a fam, there's a family who make biscuits. Uh, the other one is uh, Gandur. But oh, very similar. Yes, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. A um, couple more questions here. We've got, um, does your, this is from Charles Bush, does your editorial board make endorsements, op-eds? Uh, how does that work? Do they make op-eds? Uh, like political endorsements for candidates for well, office. Yeah. First, do you ever, ever endorse any political candidates or do you stay out of that? No, we, we, we stay out of politics. Well, our job is to report and, and not support um, any political party, any ideology, any, you know, we are completely an independent media company that uh, reports independently and we, we value that independence and we don't, we're not partisan to any ideology or belief or any faction or any party, any organization, any government we completely steer clear of any endorsement for any political or player or protagonist. Now you, you do have like anyone, you do have your opinion pieces that uh, people can write uh, in there as I think pretty much all the news uh, yeah. organizations do. And um, uh, uh, Marshawn, who you originally uh, uh, mentioned to me, I've been reading his, and of course he gives it more from a Palestinian perspective, which we don't really get a whole lot of that here uh, as, as well. So you do find some very opinionated, uh, you know, elements in, in the opinion section, but I, I'm like you, I have not seen that 
in your articles uh, at all. Um, yeah, on, uh, just on that, we do have an uh, on the website we have an opinion page, and there are opinions. It's always always we we clearly state that this is an opinion that it's not it's not endorsed by Al Jazeera. Uh, it's an opinion piece, and we'll always get a range of different opinions uh, for any particular topic. More most recently, the the conflict in Nagorno Karabakh between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, we'll always get the, uh, you know, we might have an opinion piece from an Armenian, but then there will be an opinion piece from an Azeri, uh, Azerbaijani to, to balance out. So, and of course, opinions are very, uh, are very important because uh, you can, for the journalism, you can be balanced and objective and fact-based as much as you can, but sometimes opinions uh, do present um, an argument that helps you understand one particular side of an aspect or a situation. And as long as they are clearly labeled as opinions and uh, not endorsed by the organization, then I think they are a valid um, you know, way of helping to understand situations. Here in the U.S., that's becoming a major problem, people discerning the difference between uh, opinion and news, especially because of uh, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, and so on. So, yeah, I, I think it's important that as long as they don't veer into hate speech or to, you know, any expression of condoning or supporting violence or hatred or, or anti-Semitism or anti-Islamophobia or anti-whatever, you know, as long as they are presented as a coherent, rational, and um, argument and case that doesn't veer into anything that is, um, you know, hate speech in any way. Uh, Larry was asking, uh, with the altered uh, audio for your reporter there in DC, uh, did you ever uh, determine exactly who altered that? No, uh, I believe an investigation was, was done, but um, I don't believe they found out who did it and of course somebody doing that on twitter and putting it out as a tweet and it goes viral it's difficult to know uh the the original you know who's behind the original tweet even if you can find the person who did the original tweet it might be a one of these so-called bot armies you know ro ro um uh, what they call the bots and trolls that you never quite know who's behind it. Um, so, yeah. One of the real advantages in the cyber world is, is you can be 90% sure, but it's very difficult to get that 100% uh, to take any action. So um, we've also got a question here from uh, Catherine. Uh, what it, or who is your target audience and, and does it vary by country or region? So our, our target audience for Al Jazeera English is, is the English speaking world, really. And it's, it's people that want a, an alternative perspective. Uh, it's people who want to understand very much an international, what's happening internationally. Uh, we believe that uh, we're, not, we're not based in a traditional power center like London or Paris or Washington. Of course, we have offices there, but by being based sort of outside of the so-called North or in the South, we, we are not uh, beholden to any specific power center. And so we can have a very much an internationalist uh, look at, at the world and not parochial. And, and to give an example, uh, you know, I'm British. So much of the British media would go crazy on a royal wedding. You'll remember when Prince, uh, Harry married um, Meghan Markle, uh, whenever it was a year, two years, three years ago. Uh, the whole, you know, seemingly the whole of the UK and the whole of America went crazy over this. Um, but <laughs> we just don't, we wouldn't cover that. We would, we would, it, it might feature very low down in our news bulletin. And the way we would cover it is covering the madness of the coverage of other people. Um, so we are very much an international uh, channel. You know, for us, what's important is is what's what, what are the real issues, whatever they may be, conflict, um, um, but not just conflict, but 
uh, things that are happening in the world that affect all of us as as humanity. You know, we're all in this together. Whichever country you live in, we're all united in some way, and uh, that's very much a theme. And we're united not just in in bad things, but in good things. Many of our documentaries are documentaries of inspiration, inspirational stories. Uh, so we, it's not that we just cover war and famine and disease and uh, you know grim things. We we cover inspiring stories and things that are informative, and, and we believe that's very important. I'm I'm looking right now at your site, and there's uh, one of your stories that I haven't found anywhere else is Brazil doctors run for office as country battles COVID-19 crisis. Uh, to me, that's a big story because they're they're mishandling it down there. And now you've got their doctors are going to run for office here in the United States. Hey, maybe it's not a bad idea if we had a few of our doctors run for office. <laughs> Same deal. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a big story recently has been uh, Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, yes, it, um, and it might be a little, you know, tiny region in the Caucasus, but it's pulling in Russia, it's pulling in Turkey, uh, and. Uh, it's 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 the sort of conflict that can get out of hand very easily, and before you know it, you have major pl pl major players um, involved in it. Uh, so, you know, these are the sorts of stories that are very important for us. We don't forget them, even though the U.S. election is obviously a big big story. There are other big stories happening around the world, which is it's important for us to cover. And that's like I said, I, I go to yours every day for that. Okay, I think we have time for a final question here. And Angela, you uh, actually hit the question I was going to bring up as my last one. Um, you may uh, disagree with me, <laughs> Mr. Kendall, but I have seen some of the Al Jazeera um, Arabic. And, um, I, and I've had other people tell me uh, from even in Qatar that they would compare it more to nighttime on Fox and CNN, uh, that you have a lot of loud mouths speaking a lot of nonsense um, that you don't find on Al Jazeera English. And so Angela's question is, I do not speak Arabic, but some friends who do have expressed a dissatisfaction with the Arabic version, uh, in part the use of the customary Islamic phrases are there other ways that the Arabic version is different than the English, or is it just a matter of translation, or what? So, uh, I mentioned very at the, at the beginning briefly, Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera Arabic are, are different channels in the sense that the 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 style is different. Obviously, we have different presenters. We we are presenting to a different audience. Uh, and our news coverages are, are different, but, but fundamentally the editorial ethos and the code of ethics are the same. So one example that we sometimes give is, if you remember the uh, nuclear reactor in Fukushima that um, got affected, there was the tsunami and um, the nuclear reactor was flooded. For Al Jazeera English, that was a big story and it, it carried on for a number of days. Because obviously, to our audience, nuclear, the nuclear industry and nuclear reactors, uh, we kind of know about them because they, they, we live among them. But in the Arab world, for Al Jazeera Arabic, it, it was a big story for about one day or two, or two, and then it it went off because the the issue of nuclear, the nuclear industry not being in the Middle East, uh, wasn't the same as for Al Jazeera English. So that's one example. Our news is different in the sense that we're reporting, again, editorially, the ethos is the same, but the news bulletins might have different uh, priorities for the stories. For Al Jazeera Arabic, the priority usually will be what's happening in the Middle East, uh, particularly, because that's where the audience is. Uh, so uh, the coverage is different, but that's because the audiences are different. And I, I think there is something, every culture has a way of imparting information and receiving information. Uh, and there are some shows on Al Jazeera Arabic um, that have been since the heyday, since 1996, where you have two people kind of cross-firing at each other, arguing, um, and that's, you know, that sort of debate, healthy debate is something that was very, 
popular when Al Jazeera started because you didn't have that in the region. Uh, so again, the code of ethics, the editorial ethos is the same, but the channels are different in because we are we are aiming at different audiences with different expectations and different interests. Okay. Before I uh, let Angela close us out, let, let's send I. I'm sure you're going to end me on a positive, positive note with this uh, answer to this question. Uh, can Al Jazeera remain a free, independent voice to tell people's stories from around the globe since we're seeing this attack on the press throughout the world? Our mission is to carry on doing what we're doing. Fundamentally, you know, absolutely, we have to carry on. We have to stand up against um, the attacks that, that we face and that other media face. It's very important that we stand in solidarity with other journalists uh, as they stand in solidarity with us. Uh, just to give one example, when we couldn't report in Egypt because our journalists were arrested in Egypt, CNN supported us and a CNN correspondent um, reported, did a report on behalf of Al Jazeera. And that kind of solidarity is very important. We stand by other journalists around the world uh, whenever they're attacked or intimidated or arrested. And I think media solidarity is, is hugely important in, in the, the, you know, the new world that's where, where media is increasingly coming under attack. But we, we believe in the importance of the mission um, in these times of COVID. Uh, it's even more important that the public get proper information. And so it's a very still remains a very fundamentally important job, the, the job of journalism. And without a free media, without an independent media, I think our democracies will be a lot, uh, a lot less. Uh, and will you know, it's it would be a darker world without the without a professional independent media. Well, Mr. Trendle, I will never be able to express how much I appreciate your accepting my invitation. I, I, when I sent it, I go, I know this guy's awful busy. Uh, he has all kinds of commitments, uh, but you are, uh, you've brought what I hope to the Midwest, uh, a voice to kind of really help explain what a, what a good news organization does and that, that is a valuable source. So thank you so much on behalf of myself and everyone here. So Angela. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for, for listening and it's been a pleasure to join you all. Well, it's been a fantastic presentation. Angela. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Trendle. And thank you, Don, for such a good interview. On behalf of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council, I would like to encourage everyone to um, sign up for the national conference next week. It is all virtual and you can find it. I, I put the uh, website in the chat there. Um, and join us for all of our programs coming up. Again, thank you, Mr. Trendle. Thank you, Don. And thank you all. Have a terrific weekend.